Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining class. Welcome to class uh, today. And uh, on Wednesday, we were looking at uh, Romans chapter 7. We'll continue looking at Romans chapter 7. Okay. So if you could, uh, you know, turn, I mean, look at your notes, or even you can open your Bibles as well to uh, Romans chapter 7. Okay. So we see that uh, in Romans chapter 6, you know, Paul says that, uh, you know, as believers, we are dead to sin. And here in chapter 7, he's saying that as believers, we are also not only dead to sin, but we're also dead to the, to the in-person students, to the law. Thank you, King. Okay, We are uh, not only dead to sin, but we are also dead to the law. And hence, we are free from the law, okay? Uh, however, this, uh, this does not mean that, you know, because we're dead to the law, it does not mean that the law is evil, uh, that the law is not good, but he, he mentions, he says that the law is uh, good, the law is holy, the law is spiritual, okay? And um, uh, so there's nothing wrong with the law. We read this in... Uh, in verse 12, where he says, the law is holy, uh, it's just, and it is uh, good. Okay, so what Paul is basically saying that there is nothing wrong with the law. The problem is not with the law, but the problem is with what? With the, with sin. Okay, the problem is not with the law, but the problem is uh, uh, with sin. And he says the problem is with sin because uh, you know, uh, the sin is so powerful, uh, you know, and uh, it's, uh, once people came to know about the law, the law actually highlighted sin. When the law came about, people were able to realize that, you know, that they were breaking God's standards. They were going against God's standards. They were crossing the line. They were, uh, they were doing things that were displeasing uh, uh, to God. And... Uh, you know, and so he says that uh, the law is by itself is not uh, bad, but the law is holy, just and good. But he says the problem is not with the law, but the problem is with sin, because sin is very, very powerful. He says that once he came to know about the law, you know, he came to know there's something called sin. Okay, and uh, he, uh, because the law is the one that highlights the weakness against sin, it highlights our weakness against sin. It, it, the law also shows us that we cannot keep the law in our own strength. We are weak in front of uh, uh, in front of sin. Sin is more powerful than us. That's why we yield the members of our body to uh, sin. So uh, we look. We stop at uh, verse nine, where Paul says. You know, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I uh, died. Okay, uh, just a request. Asha, can you just open those windows very stuffy, please? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we stopped at verse 9. I was just explaining verse 9 uh, on Wednesday, where Paul says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, so I said this is a very challenging verse for many to understand why, uh, because, um, you know, is Paul referring to him? After he became a believer, or is he referring him to, uh, to himself, you know, when he was, uh, before he became a believer, before he was in Christ? Or what is uh, Paul's uh, spiritual uh, situation uh, now when he is uh, writing this, okay? So um, we saw that, you know, uh, it is actually Paul referring himself uh, to before he uh, became a believer, before he was in Christ. And uh, here he says, you know, as believers, uh, you know, we are dead to the law. Those who are in Christ are dead to the law. And he also uses a phrase in um, in the first few uh, verses, he says that we are married to Christ. Okay, we are married to another, 
he says, uh, or we have become dead to the law when we are in the body of Christ, or when he says, when we are married to another, which means that we are married to Christ, which means we are spiritually uh, united with Christ. Okay, so what do we understand by this uh, phrase which he says in um, verse 9? Okay, uh, and to understand this phrase, I actually gave you an example of, uh, you know, when, uh, when people come to the age of 12 or 13, they're actually able to understand uh, rules and regulations, not in the light of just because they have to keep rules and regulations, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, because uh, their parents told uh, want them to, or uh, if they keep the rules and laws and regulations, they will receive a reward, they will get some chocolates. If they don't, then they will receive punishment. But, you know, uh, usually they say, uh, or we don't know which is the right age, but people usually say 12 or 13, uh, you know, people come to a place where uh, they come to a place of accountability, okay, uh, to the laws, to the rules. They come to a place where they are able to see the bigger picture. They are able to see God in the whole context of why they should keep the rules uh, and the laws and follow the commandments and why they shouldn't. They come to a place where they understand the commandment as having to do with God, in relationship with God. Not just to please their parents or not just to get a chocolate or reward, but, you know, uh, doing it. Uh, in a bigger context, doing it, uh, you know, uh, having in the context of their relationship with God. So likewise, Paul is saying in verse 9, when Paul came to an understanding of the law, he knew he was accountable to the standard of the law. Okay, He came to a place where he understood the commandment as having to do with God, or the law as having to do with the context of his relationship with uh, God. And he says... When he came to that understanding, what happened? Sin revived and I died. Sin revived means he's saying that there was no way he could overcome sin. Okay. Uh, sin took a hold of him. Okay. And we also know in our lives, you know, sin takes a hold of us. And sometimes it's so difficult. You know, we don't want to lose our temper when we get angry. We don't want to ban things. We don't want to say rude things. We don't want to say nasty things. But we end up doing it. And we are just, you know, after that, we are so frustrated with ourselves. We're so upset with ourselves. And we know that sin has such a powerful uh, control over our uh, life. So he's saying, you know, when he was under the law, that was he was not uh, in Christ, you know, when he was in his own, uh, you know, in the Arabic nature, uh, uh, he says, uh, you know, sin revived and I died. What does it mean, I died? He says, you know, sin is actually bringing about decay. You know, sin brings about corruption. It corrupts our thoughts. It corrupts our emotions, you know, and it ultimately destroys our life. It brings sickness and health and, you know, pain and misery. And finally, we are dying of physical death. And we also die a spiritual death. Okay. Then verse 18, uh, he says, when the understanding of the commandment came, the awareness of sin came. Verse 8, when he says, when the understanding of the commandment came, the awareness of sin came. So what is sin? You know, what is sin? How will you define sin? Simple. What is sin? Any response? Can I respond? Yeah, sure, Charles. Sin is anything that you think, you do, or you say that makes God sad. Okay, thank you, Charles. What is sin? It's a violation of the law. Okay, it's falling short uh, of God's standard. Thank you, Rose. Yes. It's violation of the law. It's breaking the commandments of God. Simple. Okay. Or uh, who says, yes, doing what we know is wrong. Okay. So um, Paul says that sin produced in me all manner of what? All manner of? Verse 8. Look at verse 8 in your Bibles. What does it say? It produced in him all manner of evil desires okay it produced in him all manner of evil desires 
okay? And uh, which is contrary to the law. Okay, all these evil desires are not what the law says, it's contrary to the law. He says only when the law was presented to him, you know, he says only when the law was presented to me, I realized that I was sinning. Not only did I realize that I was sinning, but I also realized that sin is at work in me. And in me, there is all manner of evil desires uh, in me, uh, which was causing me to break the law or causing me to sin. So only when the law came, people were able to realize that they were sinning. Uh, they realized that, uh, you know, that sin was at work in them, uh, that, uh, you know, there was all manner of evil desires in them, uh, which was causing them to break the law or causing them to uh, sin. And now as he progresses in his letter, in verses 13 to 25, he not only focuses just on the law, but he's also beginning to focus on sin. He's talking about the sinful evil desires in the person. Okay, so can somebody please read uh, verses 13 to 25, please? Verses 13 to 25. Before we read verses 13 to 25, anyone has any doubts? from verses 1 to 12? Any questions, any doubts? Anything you'd like to share? Okay, no questions, uh, no doubts? Yes, uh, Siddharth. Uh, I'm a little bit more. Those people, they, they do oh, people so who they can, so people who don't have the law, uh, did they? How would they know whether they're sinning or not? Yeah, good question. I think we already answered this. Uh, I think on Wednesday, I think somebody asked. You know, uh, Paul is writing in chapter one and chapter two. He's talking about the, you know, the Gentiles don't have the law, but they have their conscience. Okay, they have their conscience that tells them what is right and wrong. And of course, you know, the Jews have the law, but he says we'll all be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether you have the law or you have the conscience, we'll all be judged by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We went through that. And we also said we don't know how it's going to happen, but this is what God's word is. We can't, you know, we can't... Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, say anything more because that is what is revealed to us here in scripture. But um, how do the Gentiles, without having the law, how do they know what is right and wrong? Their conscience, their conscience bears witness to them. And how can the Gentiles know that there is a God even though they don't have a law? Uh, you know, Paul writes in chapter 1, he says, you know, the, the invisible attributes of God is revealed to us in creation. Okay, and the people are without any excuse. They can know the invisible attributes of God, uh, the invisible attributes of God, uh, you know, his power and his, his uh, the Godhead, the deity is revealed to us in creation. Good question. Thank you, Sidan. Anyone else has any questions? Any doubts? Yes, the the laws that God gave Moses. Yes, the law that God gave Moses. There was twenty. Uh, I mean, sorry, ten commandments. Uh, <laughs> twenty commandments. Uh, ten commandments in Exodus chapter twenty, and then of course there was about six hundred and thirteen laws that God had given them additionally. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Anyone has? Okay, if not, we will move on to verses 13 to 25. Can somebody read that, please? For until the law of sin was revealed, the sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, if there is a law of sin, it is over those who have not sinned according to the likeness of their transgressions. Of Adam, who is the type of them who is to come. A decree gift is not like the of them, so by the one of the of things many died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one, Jesus Christ, abundant 
came to many. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death came to the one much more, those who receive a burden and the means of grace, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life to the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as to one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so to one man's righteousness, as the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law declared that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace abounded much more. Thank you, Asha. So here in verses 13 to 25, you know, Paul describes his struggle. Okay. So Paul has already mentioned to us that the law highlighted. Sorry. You read the wrong scripture. You read the wrong scripture? Yeah, I read chapter 5. Okay, go ahead and read. Uh, 7 verses 13 to 5. Okay, she's read the wrong uh, scripture. And um, so we'll ask her to read uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 13 to 25 again. Yeah, go ahead. And then what did good sin done to me? Certainly not, but sin that did not curse them was producing them to me to avoid the good. So that sin through the commandment of the cross is to believe in so. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, I will choose to do that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells for it to it, will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I love the law of God according to the commandment. But I see another law in my neighbors, members, wearing against the law of my mind and bringing me to the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will do ever me from this body? I thank God to Jesus Christ our Lord, so then, with the mind and myself, so the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Thank you, Asha. So here in verses 13 to 25, you know, Paul describes uh, the struggle that he is having. Paul has already mentioned to us uh, that the law highlighted sin or made sin very visible or showed us that we were sinners, we were missing the mark, uh, we were going against God, we were disobeying him. Uh, and he says the problem is not with the law, but the problem is with sin, because the law is holy, spiritual, just, and right. And then he's saying that, but there is sin, uh, and the sin is working in my flesh, the sin is working in our flesh uh, through our natural desires, okay? So in these verses, uh, we see a struggle, okay? And Paul says, I want, what is a struggle? He says, I want to do what is right, but I can't do what is right. The same with all of us, right? We want to do things that are right. We struggle not to get angry or not to get, uh, 
to be jealous or uh, not to act in pride or not to shout or scream or um, somebody wants to be admitted in class. Okay. Yeah. So we see that, you know, um, uh, he says that, you know, we want to do what is right, but we don't do it. We desire to please God, but, you know, most often we do things that break his heart. And when we do that, we are so grieved, we are so upset uh, with ourselves. And why is that? Why does that happen? He says, you know, look at verse uh, 21. You know, in verse 21, he says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. So he's saying, you know, I want to do good. I will to do good. But he's saying, you know, uh, there's a law that works in me and that is the evil that is present in me. And what is the law? It's the law of sin. Okay. So the law of sin that is in, uh, in my body, you know, is causing me to do things that uh, God does not desire, to do things that are not right. Okay. So this law is kind of controlling me and it's the evil that is present in me. And in verse 23, he says, you know, if you look at verse uh, 23, he says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay. So he's saying that there is an evil, verse 23, is keeping my members enslaved to sin, even though in my mind I want to obey God, okay? And so in verse 24, he says, who will deliver, deliver me from this body of death? Why is he calling this the body of death? Because he's already told us in verse 13, sin produces, what does sin produce? Death, okay? The more, Paul says, the more he sins, the more it produces death. His body has become a body of death. Why? because his body is controlled by sin. And the more he's going to let his body be dominated by sin or controlled by sin, you know, sin produces death in his body or sin is, uh, death is at work in his body, okay? So in verses 13 to 25 um, is uh, a description of Paul um, or as a believer or as, as a, you know, or uh, or as Paul, a man under the law, before becoming a believer, which is a question that many people ask, okay? In these verses, is Paul, uh, you know, the description that he's given here, is Paul talking about himself as a believer? Or, you know, is he talking about himself as a man under the law, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's not yet become a believer? So many believers quote also these verses uh, to describe their struggle with sin. And they say, you know, it's okay for us to struggle with sin because Paul also struggled, you know, when he was a believer. He says, I want to do good, but uh, but I don't do it, okay? So there's a couple of things that I like to point out here. The first one is, you know, Paul is not talking about himself when he was a, he's a believer. He's not talking about himself when he is in, he is in Christ or he's not talking about himself when he's married to Christ or he's spiritually united to Christ. Paul is talking about himself here when he was under the law, okay, when he was under the law. And we saw this in verse 9, it says, when the commandment came, means when I came to know the law, sin revived in me or sin came up in me and I died. And, uh, you know, uh, and he concludes uh you know, this whole, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, section in verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. So Paul is meaning here that, you know, there is a way out. There is a way out for, uh, you know, not to be dominated by sin. There is a way out, uh, you know, uh, uh, to overcome sin, not to be under the dominion of sin. And he's pointing to the way out. And he says, you know, I feel trapped, you know, I feel trapped by the sin. 
He says, I want to do the right thing. I want to do what desires and pleases God. But, you know, I feel trapped. I can't do it. I'm just so caught up with uh, sin and there is no way out. And he's not saying that, you know, I took the way out and came to the other side and found myself trapped. No, he's not saying that. But he's saying that when I was under the law, I felt trapped under sin. You know what's meaning of trapped? Trapped means caught, you know, when like a, yeah, when a, a fisherman, like, you know, traps fish in his net or, you know, when a, when a, a hunter traps an animal in his net, they're totally trapped, they can't uh, get out. So he's not talking about being trapped when he took, takes a way out and he comes to the other side and he finds, finds himself trapped. He's not talking about when he finds a way out, that means he finds a way out in Jesus Christ and he becomes a believer or he's in Christ or he is spiritually, you know, in union with Christ, he's married to Christ. He's not talking about that. He says, no, when I am under the law, you know, I am trapped because I want to do the right things that the law is telling me, but I find sin is controlling my body. And then he says, how can I get rid of the sin that is controlling my desires and bringing about evil desires? And he points the way out. And what is the way out? Who does he point to? In verse uh, 25, he's pointing out to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so he points out to uh, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so he's pointing out to the way that he has found out of this uh, this whole being trapped under sin. And that is why, you know, when I say that uh, the experience in verses 13 to 25 does not apply to uh, Paul as a believer, because the believer is on the other side. They are not trapped by sin. Paul already tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we are dead to sin. Sin has no longer dominion. Sin has no longer control. So it's Paul's experience here in verses 13 to 25 when he is under the law and before he comes into Christ or before he encounters uh, Jesus Christ or he is born again, he becomes a new creation. So some people don't see it as we see it, but I'm sharing this uh, with you. Now, I see these verses as when Paul was under the law and not when he was uh, in Christ. So I'm just sharing you my viewpoints. You can take whatever position you feel comfortable with after reading Romans 7 or after your understanding and your study of Romans 7. And so he says in verse 25, I thank God to Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in this whole passage in uh in verses 13 to 25, there are two things that um, have to be dealt with, okay? The law has already been dealt with. We are, Paul says, we're already dead to the law. And he says, you know, in the in verse 1 uh, to verse 6, he says, we are dead to the law, we are married to Christ. Uh, uh, but here he's talking of the law of sin and the law of death. Okay, so the two things that we need to deal with here is the law of sin and the law of death. Okay, and he says in verse 9, he's already spoken to us in verse 9, he says, sin revived and I died. That means sin, he's talking about sin and death. Verse 13, he says, sin produces death. Okay, uh, that means anything that decays, corrupts and destroys. And ultimately, it is the physical death and the spiritual death. Verse 17, he says, sin dwells in me. Verse 23, the law of sin which is in my members, which means the, you know, the, the law of sin that is controlling his uh, body. Sin is controlling his body. And what is the result? Verse 24, this body of death. In sin in Paul's body, sin in our body is causing our body to die or causing his body to die. Okay, and then in verse 25, he's talking about the law of sin. So here in these verses, he's uh, dealing not with uh, the law, okay, because he's already dealt with the law. He's saying that they're already, you know, we've already dead to the law. But here he's dealing with two things. He's dealing with the law of sin and the law of death, okay? So, uh, 
So what I'm pointing out here to these verses, which I mentioned, verse 13, 17, 23, verse 24, and 25, is what I'm pointing out here is Paul is saying there are two problems here, okay? There is sin and there is death, okay? Because Paul says, who is going to set me from this sin that is controlling my flesh, that is ultimately producing what in me? It's producing death in me. So who is going to deliver me and how am I going to come out of this, okay? Now, this is, uh, why is this important? Uh, because, you know, why is these questions important? It's important of, in the light of what Paul has already said in Romans 6. You know, there is a connecting point here in Romans chapter 6, verse 19. He says, I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of my flesh. Remember that? He looked at uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 19. He says, you know, I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of my flesh. So there is a weakness in the flesh of every believer. What is it? It is sin at work. Sin is producing what? Death. And sin, if it's allowed to continue in the flesh, it will still produce death. So for a believer, how can he be set free? How does he walk free from sin that produces death in the flesh? Uh, you know, he goes on to talk about it in uh, chapter 8, where there he talks about the law of the spirit, okay? He talks about the law, then he talks about the law of sin, and he talks about the law of death, you know, and uh, he says, you know, he wants to be set free from the law of sin and death, and he says, who will set me free from this, uh, you know, law of sin and death? How am I going to be delivered? He points out to Jesus Christ, and then he goes on to write uh, in his letter, or you know, we look at it as chapter eight, where uh, you know he he talks about how a believer can be set free, uh, and how he can walk free from sin that produces death in the flesh. The answer is in chapter eight, where he's talking about the law of the spirit of life. He's saying in chapter eight that is the Holy Spirit that will enable us or it's the Holy Spirit that will help us to, you know, uh, overcome the power of, <coughs> sorry, overcome the power of sin that is in our flesh. Okay, okay so that is the end of uh, chapter 7. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? If you look at your notes, you know, there is, this, uh, Paul summarizes his own experience and his own spiritual journey. Uh, he's talking about his struggles. Verse 17, he says, what I'm doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, I do not practice. What I hate, that I do. All that he mentioned in verse 17, verse 18, he says, I want to do good, but I'm uh, unable to do it. Verse 19, the good that I will to do, I do not do it. Verse 19, it says, the will, evil I will not do that I practice. And he talks about not only struggles, but also the problems that sin dwells in me. Verse 17, my flesh, nothing good dwells. Verse 18, sin that dwells in me. Uh, verse 20, verse 21, that evil desires are present in my body. And then verse 23, he says, something is ruling in my members, fighting against my mind, bringing me captive to sin. Okay. So he's talking about the fleshly desires that war against our soul. So even when we become believers, you know, uh, uh, we are only our spirits are born again. But, you know, our flesh and our minds, our soul and our flesh has to be renewed every day. We need to be transformed every day by the renewing of our minds because our flesh has sinned the, still the whole nature, you know, and our mind, our souls also has the uh, tendency to, you know, fall back into the old sinful uh, nature. So, you know, Paul, uh, Peter says in... Um, uh, First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, that there is a war within us. The war is between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit wants to do something, but the flesh is 
weak. It's not able to do. There is a wall. And so how, uh, what is the whole thing about the answer for this, how to overcome it? The more, you know, Paul says, the more we feed our fleshly carnal nature, that is what will, you know, will dominate. But the more we feed our spirit, you know, the more we are spending time reading God's word, meditating, our intimacy with God, worshipping him, the more our spirit man is fed. When our spirit man is fed, that dominates and our flesh is not, uh, you know, our flesh becomes weakened because it's starving. It's not being fed. And once, you know, you know, when something is starving, what happens? We are dead too. We are dead to it. The person dies, right? It's the same way he says we need to feed our uh, uh, spirit and not our carnal nature. Uh, because if we keep feeding our carnal nature, you know, sin will continue to abound in our life. But when we continue to feed our spirit man, that will dominate the flesh. Okay. He presents the answer that it's, uh, you know, the answer is in Jesus Christ. But then he goes on um, to answer on how we can get rid of the law of sin and the law of death uh, as a result of sin that produces death. How can we overcome it? This he presents to us in Romans chapter 8. Okay. Anyone has any questions? Okay. Any questions? I hope you are... Uh, uh, all the online students are following. Yes, no. Any questions anyone has? Uh, you are following Sansa, and yeah, you explained the well, other but we don't have questions. We hear the end of it. Okay, thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Sasha. Anyone else has any questions, anything that you uh, have any doubts? Maybe you can just read through because we still have some time. We have 13 minutes and uh, if anyone has, we won't uh, begin chapter 8. We'll take it on uh, next Wednesday and then we, on Friday as well. So. Yes, uh, sorry. Yes, I'll just uh, I'll just mention that in a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Christopher, you have a question. Sorry, Christopher, I thought you had a question. Christopher, are you there? No, no, I am sorry. I must have pressed the button by mistake. Okay, sorry. okay, no worries. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Mangi. Okay. Um, okay. First off, we understand that not the, uh, those who are in Christ, there's no, no longer fun condemnation uh, because we, we, we now have Christ and law has no dominion over us. However, in, uh, I think that Peter or John would say that if someone continues sin, there's no more, um, someone is in Christ, uh, keep on sinning, there's no more sacrifice left for them. So what is the relationship uh, between that person who, con who knows Christ and he knows he, he continues sinning and the law? Or is he still going to be judged based on the law or is he going to be judged based on uh, trust, correct? Okay, so you're saying that, um, uh, that you know, uh, Romans chapter 8 was one begins with saying that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so, you know, we don't stand condemned before God, but God, yes, he knows that we are weak, we are sinful people, we, um, 
we um, uh, we cannot keep all of the laws. We break the laws. Uh, yes, and that's why the answer he's giving us is the, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, who enables us and helps us. And, you know, uh, like we also spoke in, in, in chapter 6 about uh, grace and law. Grace uh, uh, not only keeps us away from sin, also empowers us to keep us away from sin. And... Um, uh, so you're saying that what if somebody living uh, under grace and as a believer will, uh, you know, they continue to sin and you're, you're mentioning about Hebrews uh, chapter 8 where there's no more forgiveness of sins left but only a dreadful punishment. But you now uh, it does not qualify what extent of sin that person goes or they come to a place where there is no more forgiveness of sins that is left but only a dreadful uh, punishment. Uh, we we don't uh, know what is that extent, um, but we don't go to that extent because we because we, we can't say well because I don't know I can to any extent I can go to sin because I don't know what extent God is going to really uh, you know there's no more forgiveness of sins. But uh, the whole issue about sinning is you know even as Paul is trying to say is you know when you are in Christ you cannot sin. See when you are spiritually united to Christ, there's no way that you can sin. So that's not just a truth, but something that we need to also, you know, make it as a reality in our life. And there's something that we need to also need to keep telling ourselves that, no, I just can't sin. I can't just do it. You know, this is not something that I need to do or continue uh, doing. So, uh, uh, so the what is the extent of what a person, there's no more forgiveness of sins, we do not know because there is no explanation given to us in scripture. But however, we know that we cannot keep on continuing to sin because once we love God and once we uh, uh, are in Christ, you know, we can't just sin, you know. Uh, and if you're continuing to sin, then there's a big question mark about our whole salvation experience. Uh, our salvation experience can only be that we have experienced Jesus as we've received him as our savior and not as Lord of our life. So some people very conveniently uh, for salvation, they experience Jesus Christ as their savior because he saved them from their sins. They're very happy that their sins are forgiven, they're going to heaven. But most of them don't, you know, experience, uh, accept him as Lord. His salvation is complete when we accept him uh, him as savior and as lord that means lord over every area of our life submitting to him obeying him in every area of our life and then you're asking how will they be judged whether they'll be judged according to the law uh or uh like i already said in the beginning of the class when siddhant asked the question you know uh, we need to go back to what scripture says and scripture says in, uh, we already looked at it in uh, Romans chapter uh, 2, where it says that, you know, uh, you know, Jews, we cannot say that, uh, you know, you have the law, uh, but you will not be judged by the law, uh, neither the Gentiles by their conscience, but we will all be judged by the, what does he say, the gospel of Christ. Okay, so it says we'll all be judged by the uh, gospel. Okay, so... Uh, that is what he he mentions, I think, in um, in chapter two. Okay, so did that answer your question? Uh, yes, Pastor. Because uh, the uh, you hear about ministers uh, sin falling into sin. You hear uh, people working with God. Uh, doing things that uh, are contrary to the Bible, then uh, we ask, was oh, that, oh, that guy saved? And if he was saved and he knew the Lord, the Lord and he knew the law, how come? And how, how is he going to be saved? How is he going, is he going to heaven? How is he going to be judged? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you're talking about um, the people who, um, uh, you you know, are believers who are ministers, who are pastors, and they, um, you know, they fall back, they still sin. Uh, and what happens to them? Is that what you're asking? Yes, 
they're also part of the equation here. So include all believers, including pastors, including bishops. Okay. Yes. So, um, you know, uh, so the whole thing is that, you know, uh, we don't condemn them. Okay. Because first of all, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So we have no right to condemn. But yes, it does not mean also that we stay silent to sin. There is uh, all rights, you know, you have to uh, take the elders and you have to speak to them. And uh, that's what he's, when he writes to Timothy, he says, you know, take the elders, you know, explain to them. And if they still continue to sin, then, you know, there's nothing uh, more that you can really uh, do. You know, you just have to leave them uh, uh, because they will be uh, judged by God. Okay, so we also do not know what is the extent, but we know that the Holy Spirit will continue to work in their lives, uh, will continue to minister, will continue to bring them to a place where, uh, you know, they are willing to, uh, you know, change. And if they're willing to change, then uh, good for them. If they're not willing to change, then, you know, as... Uh, God gives us the free will to choose. Uh, he leaves it upon us. We face the consequences for our sin. Uh, but is there no forgiveness left for them? We really don't know. You know, uh, to what extent of sin that they go to. Uh, but yes, it's sad that uh, many of them, uh, many pastors, uh, do fall into sin. Uh, but it's also as uh, people. Uh, you know, we are supposed to be praying for them, uh, correcting them, uh, admonishing them, helping them out. And if they're not willing, you know, uh, Paul says to such people, you know, give them up to Satan. You know, give them up to Satan. And uh, he's not saying that uh, so that they can be destroyed. But he's saying once you, you know, they come out of the spiritual covering, the spiritual protection, you know, they're open to the attacks of the evil one. They face all the difficulties, and then they realize their sin. They will come back to uh, God. So the purpose of God for doing that is to bring them back to uh, uh, restore them. So God is in the process of restoring people, not wanting anyone to perish. But if people continue in their sin, you know, then uh, yeah, we do not know what is the extent of grace that is available for them what, uh, you know, levels that they fall to where there is no more forgiveness of sins. But we just have to learn from their lives that we don't go to that extent or we don't fall to that level that um, we don't do the sins that they are doing. I hope I was able to answer that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Because we really can't say what, you know, we need able to judge. God is the judge, but we just do our part. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no question, just want to say that, uh, you know, we uh, I, was, I scheduled the first assessment for uh, this coming Monday, but uh, I like to postpone it to the following Monday. Is it okay with all of you? Yeah, so the first assessment I had scheduled it for um, 18th, but uh, just seems to be a very hectic week for me and a very hectic weekend as well. So if I could move it to uh, the 25th, is it okay with all of you? Sorry for the inconvenience and change. Is it fine with all of you? Yes, okay. Okay, so we'll I'll uh, post the questions on uh, the twenty fifth of uh, of September. Okay, which is uh, sorry, not the twenty fifth. It's the twenty sixth. is a Monday. Yeah. Okay, twenty sixth. Okay. Uh, if there's no questions. We will end class. Thank you all for uh, joining class today, and have a blessed weekend. And uh, see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor.